Okay, well, I have a minute after, so we are going to go ahead and get started so we have plenty of time to um, enjoy our lovely presentations. Um, so welcome to the third and um, final session of our A Global Perspective on Emerging Technologies, a series of business lightning talks. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening to all our colleagues around the world. My name is Carla Ruffer, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Center for European Studies at the University of Florida. I'm joined by my colleagues from the Georgia Institute of Technology Center for International Business Education and Research, Texas A&M Mays Business School Center for International Business Studies, and the University of Washington Foster School of Business Global Business Center. This event is also co-sponsored by the George Washington University Center for International Business, Education and Research, the Indiana University Center for International Business Education and Research, San Diego State University, Wendy Gillespie Center for Advancing Global Business, the University of Texas at Austin South Asia Institute, and the University of Maryland Robert H. Smith School of Business Center for Global Business. Um, the subject of emerging technology is very broad. And our speakers today will show some of that range by focusing on environmental technology, startups, and technology and marketing. Um, a few brief housekeeping notes. Each speaker will present for about 15 minutes. These talks are designed to provide flashes of information and insight. Uh, we will have a few moments for Q&A after each speaker. If you are interested in asking a question, please submit that through the Q&A button. And you can do that at any time during the presentation. So without further ado, we'll get started. Our first speaker is Chris Woodruff. His talk is Ending the PFAS Cycle, Innovative Technologies to Remove Forever Chemicals. Chris is the co-founder and COO of Aquaga Inc. Chris has a wide breadth of engineering experience spanning the aerospace, consumer electronics, and construction industries. His volunteer work with Engineers Without Borders piqued his interest in projects geared toward making a social and environmental impact. And with that, I will hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Carla. Thanks for having me this morning. All right, well, uh, yeah, as Carla mentioned, I'm gonna uh, focus on uh, this, this talk around ending the PFAS cycle. So first I'm gonna uh, introduce what PFAS are, um, what these forever chemicals we talk so much about, where they come from, what they're used in, et cetera, why they're a problem. Um, what Aquaga is doing to help clean up uh, these chemicals from the environment, and then talk a little bit about our story of how we got here, um, spinning out of the University of Washington about four years ago. So uh, first, one quick uh, overview of our team. We are based uh, here in Tacoma, Washington, about an hour south of Seattle. Um, uh, as Carla mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders and COO alongside Nigel, our CEO. Uh, he was working as an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Alaska Fairbanks prior to founding Aquaga. And Brian, our CTO, he and I were classmates at the University of Washington a few years ago, um, both in the mechanical engineering department. And then our expanded team on, on the right there, we've grown to a team of 14 in the last few years. And we are working so working very closely with research partners at the University of Washington, as well as the Colorado School of Mines. And I'd like to do a quick uh, explanation, introduction to, to the name Aquaga. Um, Aquaga is actually an extinct type of uh, zebra, and uh, we like to present ourselves as a zebra company in the startup ecosystem as opposed to a unicorn. Um, and what makes zebra companies a little bit different is that uh, they are uh, for profits with a purpose to make a social environmental impact. So we are registered as a public benefit corporation, um, which allows us to make decisions not just on bottom line, um, but drive the company to make the biggest uh, impact in the world. So what we do at Aquaga, uh, we provide uh, PFAS destruction equipment and services focusing on the environmental remediation and industrial wastewater treatment industries. Uh, I will explain a little bit about what PFAS are in the next couple of slides, um, but really, you know, what we're trying to provide uh, for our customers is safe and clean disposal of, of potentially hazardous waste, reduction of liability, um, reduction in costs, um, as well as compliance with emerging regulation and prevention of future contamination of these chemicals in the environment. 
So now let, let's talk uh, a little bit about what PFAS uh, are. They're they're often called uh, forever chemicals. Um, they've been in in production for almost a hundred years now, for a various uh, various applications as industrial coatings um, in things like Gore-Tex, Scotch Guard, Rain-X, um, due to their water resistant um, properties, uh, as well as uh, one of the biggest sources of environmental. Uh, pollution is the use of industrial firefighting foam. So AFFF aqueous film forming foam is used at military installations, oil and gas facilities, airports across the country and across the world. Um, and from there, these chemicals bleached into soil, groundwater, surface water, um, and uh, really have become very prevalent in the environment to such an extent that studies have shown that over 99% of humans have uh, quantifiable levels of PFAS in their blood. And why uh, having PFAS in our blood is a concern um, is because there's a, a litany of uh, understood health consequences around PFAS exposure, including pregnancy complications, developmental issues, uh, various types of cancer um, and endocrine disruption. Um, and uh, with this, this known exposure and these these known health concerns, there's been you know much uh, greater public awareness of this issue in the last few years, including folks such as uh, Trevor Noah and uh, John Oliver highlighting uh, PFAS in recent episodes, um, which has really uh, kind of uh, brought a, brought a lot of attention to the work we're doing and to to PFAS as an issue um, just nationwide. And on, uh, related to that, we wanted to show a map here showing uh, just what a prevalent issue this is across the country. Um, looking at uh, this is a, a map published by the Environmental Working Group showing drinking water, uh, military sites, and other known uh, industrial sources of PFAS and where these uh, are impacting water sources and communities adjacent to these facilities. And uh, in response to these concerns, uh, the EPA has launched uh, a uh, strategic PFAS roadmap in the last couple of years, um, trying to accelerate the, the pace of research and actions to tackle this uh, emerging environmental and public health crisis. Um, and uh, this includes setting uh, proposed drinking water levels for six of the most prevalent PFAS, um, as well as uh, potential hazardous waste designation for a couple of these chemicals and really um, making PFAS a national en enforcement and compliance initiative. And because this is a, a global business talk, I thought it's worth highlighting that uh, this is not an issue just in the US, um, looking at PFAS as more of a global challenge. Uh, there's been some recent coverage uh, over in Europe um, around Chemors and 3M, uh, as well as DuPont, some historically uh, some of the largest uh, producers of PFAS for use in uh, consumer products um, and uh, various lawsuits, uh, fines and regulations limiting the, their ability to produce these chemicals um, and uh, setting setting standards for, for better wastewater treatment on the back end of these industrial facilities. Uh, outside of Europe, um, you know, the one of the industries that uh, the PFAS are used uh, that is kind of just recently getting more traction is in uh, production of semiconductors. So um, in, in Japan, Korea, and China, there's, you know, a growing understanding of uh, the concerns around emitting the, these chemicals in industrial wastewater um, as well. Uh, also, there's been some coverage in, in Japan recently from some uh, AFFF foam, firefighting foam discharge at military installations resulting in ground groundwater contamination and uh, community exposure. Uh, I mentioned some of the re recent uh, attention in China as well. Uh, Australia has been kind of leading some of the R&D efforts as well as litigation and development of new technologies for addressing PFAS as well with uh, you know very prevalent use with, within their Department of Defense. Now, uh, why uh, why PFAS are so challenging to clean up? What makes uh, what drives this need for new technologies is uh, this moniker of forever chemical. So, they are uh, very stubborn recalcitrant compounds um, which cannot be 
destroyed by conventional techniques. So historically, the way to manage PFAS in, in industrial wastewater has been to either incineration or landfilling. There's been recent uh, research showing that incineration only partially breaks down these chemicals and uh, uh, cut, produce, uh, pr pr produces the risk of reintroduction into the environment as well as uh, production of other toxic byproducts such as hydrofluoric acid. So really uh, the work we're doing at Aquaga is developing this alternative destruction approach. So it, developing a technology to remove the liability by ending the PFAS cycle once and for all on site and uh, you know, plugging in on the back end of other uh, existing soil and groundwater treatment technologies to break down these chemicals in uh, high, high, uh, low volume, high, high concentration byproducts of other, other technologies. Uh, so a little bit about how the technology works. Uh, we like to describe it as a pressure cooker on steroids. So we use this process called hydrothermal alkaline treatment. Um, hydrothermal implies high temperatures and high pressures. Alkaline uh, implies high pH, so we use uh, sodium hydroxide or caustic soda, a very common chemical used in, in cleaning products to increase the pH, which has been demonstrated uh, in various studies through some of our research partners to completely mineralize these compounds uh, and producing no uh, toxic byproducts on the back end. Uh, a little bit of how how this technology plugs i mentioned we, we integrate this with uh other existing water and soil treatment processes so if we look at this flow chart showing um you know contaminated media media being water or soil on the left um, for soil there's different processes that basically desorb or separate these chemicals from soil and produce a liquid waste stream so that can be a wa soil washing process or thermal desorption, essentially bringing soil up to high enough temperatures to evaporate off the water, both the water and the PFAS, um, and then take that liquid waste stream through a separation or concentration technology. What I've listed here is uh, things like foam fractionation, regenerable resins, or uh, reverse osmosis. So this is another area where there's a lot of innovation in the PFAS space. Uh, foam fractionation is a technology that kind of operates like a a pond skimmer in a fish tank using uh, micro bubbles to bring PFAS to the surface and then uh, forming a foam and then essentially scraping that foam off to the top. Um, regenerable ion exchange resins. Uh, ion exchange resin is a kind of a long existing technology in the water treatment industry, but I'm looking at ways to use solvents to basically strip the chemicals from these spent resins and produce a PFAS rich waste on the back end, which we can then treat with our hydrothermal alkaline treatment process. And then on the back end, as I mentioned, uh, we have treated water that's safe for discharge, as well as uh, benign salts, such as calcium fluoride, sodium fluoride, things that are in, in, in toothpaste. Wanted to highlight what an example project looks like for us. So this is some work we did uh, in 2023, looking at uh, a PFAS impacted pond at the Fairbanks International Airport. Um, we brought this stage one technologies, this foam fractionation I mentioned to essentially take 20,000 gallons of uh, water that had been polluted by the historical use of firefighting foam and reduce that down to about 1,000 gallons of highly concentrated PFAS rich foam. Uh, and we then brought our technology, uh, this PFAS destruction unit on site um, to safely break down uh, the remaining PFAS in that foam. Largely, the, the industries that, that we're serving uh, on the industrial, industrial wastewater side are uh, manufacturing. I mentioned uh, these chemicals are still in production today in, in various forms. Uh, semiconductor is uh, another industry that, that uses these heavily in, in the production of, of microchips. Uh, as well as solid waste uh, due to the prevalence of PFAS in the environment, they are often ending up in our landfills um, and ending up in, in landfill leachate at the bottom of, of those landfills. And then on the government side, uh, with the use of these chemicals in industrial firefighting foams, there's uh, huge remediation efforts across the country, uh, largely focused on uh, military um, and defense applications. 
as well as municipal waste and wastewater. So uh, now jump into some of the fun stuff. Uh, how did we go from here? This is a photo from uh, 2019, a uh, total vaporware mock-up of what, what a unit might look like to uh, late in 2023, we had Governor Inslee at our facility here in Tacoma, kind of highlighting the work we're doing locally here. So a um, bit of a quick origin story uh, of Aquaga. So first introducing uh, the TRL level um, for folks that, that are not familiar with this, this is technology readiness level. So kind of giving a, a gauge of how um, technologies can go from a university scale out into industry, um, ranging from a one, which is basic principles, to a nine, which is a demonstrated proven product out in the real world. So, you know, fortunately uh, for, for clean tech companies, there's a lot of uh, government funding to pursue technical val validation on R&D. Uh, we've been really fortunate with the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, um, Within the DOD, we've uh, received funding from both both the Air Force and DARPA, and uh, these awards range from you know fifty to two hundred and fifty k for Phase One grants uh, to up to two million dollars in two year period of performance for for two year projects. And this helps kind of bridge the gap from that university scale out to uh, industrial scale, and you know support the use case for additional private investment into technologies. I realize we are coming up on 15 minutes here, so I will kind of breeze through the last couple of slides here. Um, you know, originally this, this I mentioned this started at the University of Washington. The fundamental research was on um, using a supercritical water oxidation, a, a similar technology to what we're using now for chemical warfare agent destruction um, due to uh, stockpiles of chemical warfare agents found during, during conflict in Syria. Um, we took this and went through a uh, program called the National Science Foundation i and really wanting to explore applications for, for this technology out in industry. Our first, first year, we were really fortunate to go through a couple programs at the University of Washington, the Environmental Innovation Challenge and Dempsey Startup Competition um, that gave us, you know, just some small amounts of funding to, to complete some early proof of process, proof of concept research and pull together proposals for some larger uh, grants from other federal agencies. You know, this translated to uh, a couple of awards from the EPA and National Science Foundation in 2021, which allowed us to double the size of our team, uh, hire our first three employees outside of our my, my three co-founders, and uh, go out and, you know, start exhibiting at trade shows, build our first prototype, the photo you see on the right there. Uh, that first prototype was uh, built in a a uh, 20 foot shipping container out in the yard here in Tacoma. And uh, by the end of uh, 2021, early 2022, we had that unit operational to run our first customer feasibility studies um, with some you know, real world samples. Um, this is, these are a couple photos running those studies in 2022. Um, and then looking into 2023 over the last year, we took that you know first MVP uh, level prototype and built kind of the next iteration. Uh, again, doubled the size of our team, and you know this this time, you know building a more robust unit, you know with the the goal of uh, bringing it out on site to a uh, customer site. That being the Fairbanks project I mentioned earlier, and um, we got to celebrate in uh, August of last year having this unit, you know, finished operational, tested, and packaged for shipment out to a project site. Um, and, you know, this is some of the real world work we got to do uh, traveling up to Fairbanks in uh, negative 30 degrees last January to do some some site scoping. Um, and then, you know, actually in July, August, September of last year, starting to bring actual equipment out to the site, doing this foam fractionation uh, to pump and treat water out of this pond. And uh, eventually, you know, bringing our uh, PFAS destruction unit out to the site. So this was our first first field work uh, for this technology, you know, first of its kind demonstration for this HALT technology uh, outside of a, a lab or a simulated environment. And building on that, we have, you know, five more similar projects planned for the next year, year and a half um, at various sites across the country, a mix of government, DOD, and um, industrial sites. And 
want to wrap up and just uh, kind of acknowledge a lot of the affiliations. You know, this this presentation today came through a U University of Washington connection. We, you know, we've been very fortunate to work with a handful of universities, um, a handful of accelerator programs, um, including the the Jones and Foster, um, and um, also re received funding from seven seven different federal agencies at this point. And uh, as we've transitioned out to more uh, industry facing work, uh, have you know built strong relationships with various trade groups, um, you know helping make that uh, commercialization transition. So I know I dove through a lot of uh, content there. My email is in the last slide here. Feel free to reach out with with any questions. And thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate that presentation. Um, we just have about a minute. Um, so I'm going to ask a quick question and then also let our attendees know that if you do have questions, you can still put them in the Q&A. If we have an opportunity to come back, we will do that. Um, so Chris, just one curiosity from my perspective is um, on the opposite end of the flow of PFAS here, um, are there some technologies uh, trying to change the production side, like a creation of uh, these chemicals in in all the various forms that they are currently being used? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, specifically around firefighting foams, there's been, you know, decades of research into fluorine-free foams. Uh, I think the FAA last year finally approved a fluorine-free alternative to AFFF. So there's a lot of uh, research going into that. And then on the, uh, like, industrial side, like consumer product type applications, uh, you know, various states have proposed bans on PFAS in uh, a wide range of consumer products. So looking at like wax-based alternatives um, and for other fluorine-free alternatives. So yes, I think uh, that, you know, it's not an area we're involved in, but we certainly track it. Um, and there is a, 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 a lot of folks working on that. Very cool. It's a long way to go, but it's nice to know that it's being addressed from all ends. <laughs> So again, thank you so much. Um, and we will uh, move on to our next speaker, um, James Hoadley. His talk is High Tech Startups in Southeast Asia, How Regional Firms Are Leveraging Emerging Technologies to Become Unicorns. Mr. Hoadley is Associate Director of the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business Cyber. He lived in Japan for nearly eight years where he worked for Seiko Epson Corporation. He also worked as human resources manager for Japanese-owned auto parts supplier in South Carolina before coming to Georgia Tech. With that, I will hand it over to James. Well, thank you very much. All right. Uh, so the uh, previous speaker uh, did mention uh, unicorns, and I'm going to uh, uh, apologize that I do have a little bit of a definition here, but I guess I can go through that really fast. I'm going to assume that people know what unicorns are. So when you think about uh, startup firms, particularly when you think about um, high tech startups, when you think about unicorns, you probably you probably think of Silicon Valley. You might think of uh, uh, maybe uh, other parts of the world. Uh, China might pop into your mind. But you might not think of Southeast Asia. And actually, Southeast Asia has a surprisingly large number of uh, high tech startups, particularly that have reached unicorn status. So let me dive right into that. So first I want to define, not everybody knows what ASEAN is. ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's a union of 10 nations in Southeast Asia. It is kind of a trading block like NAFTA was, or it's not the European Union. It's kind of a hybrid, but it's uh, the, the 10 major nations of Southeast Asia. That was the, where we looked in our research um, at startups. A unicorn is a privately held startup a uh, company with a valuation of a billion or more, which uh, that term was coined by venture capitalist Eileen Lee in 2013. And presently, uh, Southeast Asia is home to 50 unicorns, uh, 25 in Singapore, 16 in Indonesia, uh, four in Vietnam, three in Thailand, two in the Philippines and Malaysia. And there are a number of interesting things going on there. First off, uh, Singapore, you can see in terms of population from the table below, very high per capita GDP, but very low population. Indonesia, comparatively low per capita GDP, but very high population. Um, and so which one being on there is interesting to you uh, depends on what 
what uh, you define as interesting. But we're going to go through quickly through four of those countries in ASEAN and look at startups there. So the entrepreneurs in emerging, emerging economies, um, they have a number of unique problems that they have to face. Is there venture capital available? Well, yes, but venture capital in Southeast Asia doesn't take the same format that we are used to, say, in Silicon Valley. It's not where you write a proposal and you go to structured VCs and they're constantly out there looking for uh, companies to invest in. You actually have to know someone. It has to be uh, networked, even in Singapore, which operates as the most Western uh, economy in that region. Um, some of the elements that uh, foster innovation in Southeast Asia um, is the access to finance. There is a great deal of access to finance um, in Southeast Asia today, but it you got to know who and how to get to it. The big thing that's really interesting, um, I think, is that high tech, a lot of the technological ad advances that we've seen in recent years are actually driving this um, entrepreneurship boom in Southeast Asia. Um, and that that you wouldn't have seen this level of, of entrepreneurship without all of the high tech solutions that are now being leveraged in those um, countries and, and cultures. Um, and they also have very strong social networks and partnerships uh, amongst entrepreneurs where they have the ability to talk with each other. Uh, a lot of them are foreign educated uh, and uh, have networks that they went to uh, schools uh, outside of their home countries for the entrepreneurs. So that also fosters uh, a culture of entrepreneurship that is growing. So looking at Thailand, um, in Thailand, the government has made significant efforts to promote entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, they have provided direct tax uh, benefits, grants, and money with a board of investment that is actually directed towards trying to promote more uh, startups, more uh, hopefully developing more unicorns. Uh, they actually have a Ministry of Digital Economy and Society uh, and a na national startup committee that were established to generate ideas to improve the environmental ecosystem. And it seems that those efforts are bearing some fruit. So one of the advantages for from Thailand's standpoint, Thailand is the only country in Southeast Asia, was never colonized, does not have that kind of necessarily alignment per se. And so they tend to have more positive relations with less fractious relations with all of their neighbors. And so Thailand has a very stable, comparatively, stable economy, not so much on the political side, but that's a different talk for another day. But economically, Thailand tends to be tends to be stable and it tends to to have stable trade relationships with its uh, neighbors. And of course, the government uh, support for startups is uh, favorable for the development of unicorns. One of the examples that I found uh, of that uh, is a company called Sunday. Uh, Sunday, I think, actually might be domiciled officially in Singapore. This is one of the things that makes Southeast Asia a little bit challenging because where is a company located? Well, do you go by where it's domiciled? Mm. Um, or it might be in Malaysia, I'm not sure. But it's an insure tech firm, which means that it's a an online insurance company. As Thailand is developing and becoming more wealthy, there are greater there are greater needs for insurance for a whole bunch of things. And what Sunday is specializing in uh, is non-life insurance in three verticals, uh, health insurance, uh, electronic devices, and vehicles. The one that's particularly interested I interesting in vehicles is they actually have a partnership with Chinese uh, EV manufacturer BYD, which um, is either the number one or number two uh, electric vehicle manufacturer in the world. And they are one of the uh, options that is given for um, auto insurance at the time uh, that people purchase an electric vehicle in Thailand. They use AI to uh, for claims adjustment, um, such as assessing damage and recommending uh, whether to repair or replace. And of the electric vehicles that were sold in Southeast Asia in the first quarter of 2023, 79% of them were sold in Thailand. Um, that you know, versus all of the other countries in Southeast Asia. So that means that there is a large uh, market for insurance, for um, 
for services like Sunday. And they are using that. Okay, next, Indonesia. Indonesia has the second largest venture capital fi financing market in Southeast Asia. They've got 129 local venture capital funds um, as of 2021. Uh, there's been some consolidation, I think, since then, but it's still a very large number. Uh, but they don't have a deep VC base. They're very good at getting the initial stage of, st of startup. But the challenge for Indonesian startup firms is moving to that second level. I don't want to make it sound like they don't have any success because, as I highlighted, Indonesia has the second highest number of um, unicorns in Southeast Asia including, well, it's no longer a unicorn because it has graduated, but two uh, uni unicorns, uh, Tokopedia and um, uh, Gojek, merged to form a company called GoTo, uh, G-O-T-O, and that company by itself accounts for 2% of the GDP of all of Indonesia, just with those two firms. And those firms prior to 2015 didn't even really exist. So certainly there are firms that are being successful um, and there are firms that are 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 growing. Both firms are e-commerce-ish. Uh, Gojek started out as basically an Uber for the backseat of a scooter. Um, Gojek is kind of a play on words from Ojek, which is the the Indonesian word that used that ref, used to refer to uh, a rental. Uh, basically a, a ride share program for scooters, because if you've ever been to Jakarta, it's impossible to get around in a car. Well, not impossible, but really hard to get around in a car. And also people's economic status means that there's an awful lot of scooters um, available. And it was a way to ride share on the back of the backs of scooters. Okay. Um, the also in Indonesia, you have government uh, movement to try and promote this under uh, current president Jokowi, who is um, in his final year of his second term, can't run again. But uh, this is one of the things reasons why they has an 80 uh, percent approval rating. Um, so one of the things that he promoted through the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, uh, he promoted his administration promoted a medium term investment plan for higher education to promote entrepreneurship at top universities. So you had a whole bunch of Indonesian universities not doing a whole lot in terms of promoting entrepreneurship. Suddenly there's a government push. And now that's that's all they can talk about. Uh, it, they want to encourage the emergence of three new unicorns. Uh, well, well, that was 2020 to 2024. They've already they've gotten that. By by oh yeah by 2022 they already had nine, um, in addition to the five that existed in 2019. So, it's been highly successful. And this is a firm. Um, we're gonna deal with a startup firm quickly that is not from Southeast Asia. It's actually an Indian firm, but it is trying. It is making a very strong push into Indonesia. This is the use of AI for agriculture. Um, and you can see from an example right here, it's uh, Kisan AI. It it's trained. It's a trained AI agent, just like uh, Chat GPT. But you can go and ask it questions, and it will give you natural answers from its large language model of uh, agricultural advice. And it can do it in any language that you need, uh, because AI uh, AI chatbots are very good at. Um, teaching themselves other languages. This one was just in English, so you can see what the example is here. So the idea here is uh, farmers uh, in Indonesia would sign up for this service, and then they would be able to ask specific questions related to agriculture. Uh, this one's more of a broad question, but they are more they, they can be more specific. Um, and for agricultural workers, this is a great. It now they don't have to wonder whether what they're doing is the right thing or not. They have a, a clear tool that can show them uh, the right way to, to progress. And this actually is an Indonesian startup. Um, it's not a unicorn yet uh, that I am aware of, but um, uh, e-fishery, um, what part of aquaculture is an important part as well of the Indonesian economy. And this is a, an app, a startup app for um, Indonesian uh, Indonesian fishers, uh, and they are 
coincidentally have been so successful in Indonesia, they're actually entering into India. So that's a, kind of why I wanted to play them off against each other. Um, they have raised over 200 million in Series D funding, which values it at 1.4 billion. So it does make so. No, I'm sorry, it isn't. A, it isn't. A, um, um, it is a uh, a unicorn. In addition to having the app, it is a an end to end solution for um, people who are trying to conduct green fishing, green aquaculture. Uh, it, that it can supply them not only with the instructions on how to do it, but also all of the materials and and uh, equipment that they need to do that as well. Um, so it's the real questions, of course, I guess, is how scalable is it? And we'll see as it expands into India how scalable it is. Moving on to the Philippines, uh, the Philippines has the highest societal impression of entrepreneurship, which means the Fil Filipinos are the most positive on entrepreneurship in Southeast Asia with 76% uh, of it rating that they had positive impressions of entrepreneurs and 73% rated entrepreneurship as a good career choice. But in the case of the Philippines, even though people like entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, raising capital is a challenge. Uh, almost half of them have walked away, uh, uh, potential entrepreneurs have walked away from partnerships or investments due to a lack of a shared vision. So uh, also low valuation has been another reason, another uh, concern in the Philippines, but that's not to imply that the Philippines doesn't have a vibrant um, startup um, culture. Uh, it does lag behind its Southeast Asian neighbors, making only 9% uh, of venture capital funding in, the South, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, the Philippine diaspora has been really influential on this, particularly on the, at the early startup phases. Uh, allowing people who have ideas back in the Philippines to access capital to start up their ideas through something like a Kickstarter, only uh, it's not Kickstarter, I forget what it's called in the Philippines, but yeah, they have their own version. Uh, here's an example of one startup. Uh, by, uh, I apologize for anyone who speaks uh, Tagalog. Uh, buy now, magbayad mamaya, which means buy now, pay later. Um, it, the idea there there was a big push uh, for banking the unbanked in uh, the Philippines. And that was a number of startups uh, operated in that space to try and help people who are unbanked do electronic banking. Uh, what they have found is that that's not, there's a reason that those people are not banked, which is that they don't have enough money to make it a viable um, segment for a bank to commercialize. So instead what they have shifted to is um, taking people who have existing banking services and increasing the convenience of using online banking to get them to move from a traditional bank to an online bank to eliminate some of the uh, structural hangups. And, and uh, you know, you can get money now anywhere, anytime, and it's electronic through an electronic payment system. You don't have to worry about things that probably young people listening to this are probably like, what is a cash? What's an ATM? What's a cash machine? You may not even remember by this point, but that's still an issue in the Philippines. They're transitioning from uh, a cash-based society to an electronic society. And that coincides with the development of, um, of online banking. Uh, Singapore is uh, clearly uh, punching far above its weight in terms of population um, in the startup space. Uh, Everything that happens in Singapore happens in part because the government has uh, decided that that's a direction that Singapore wants to go in. Um, so the government has set aside 300 million in startup uh, funds, which doesn't sound like very much. But, you know, when you're in the early phases, um, a small amount of money can get you very far. And they're trying to invest in things like uh, deep tech, and they also want to encourage more entrepreneurship. So Singapore was very early to the game in promotion, promoting entrepreneurship and has had very strong government uh, influence along the way. Government influence is a two-edged sword. It's good if it encourages people to undertake entrepreneurial moves that they have not done before or might not have done, but it's negative if the government is kind of picking winners and losers rather than letting things uh, organically move in the way that they want to. 
Um, you can see parallels between this and the now not necessarily entrepreneurial, but in uh, post-war uh, Japan, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry uh, was very um, directive in uh, what uh, businesses succeeded and which ones didn't. I see I'm running out of time, so I'll try and wrap it up. Um, one of the things that Singapore is highlighting is they're trying now to push green computing, uh, reducing power usage, uh, powering from alternate sources, um, using non-power options. They have put us the, this development, uh, Singapore Media Development Authority has set aside $30 million to push for that. That's a recent announcement. So that's a very in, an interesting um, development. Um, so con caveats and conclusions, uh, you, you shouldn't necessarily decide whether a country is, is successful in entrepreneurship or not just on the basis of how many unicorns it has, because it's a very imperfect measure and unicorns as you could guess from the name, are unusual. Um, Singapore is unique uh, in a lot of ways, which makes it difficult as a model to uh, map other places. Indonesia serves better as a model for other ASEAN countries, but um, how, why it's done so well, is that necessarily going to apply to other countries in Southeast Asia? We don't know. And the free trade uh, component of ASEAN, I said ASEAN was a uh, regional, uh, they have a free trade agreement. It benefits starts up, startups in the region because very quickly they're able to move beyond their, their home market into other markets, which makes it easier for them to scale up. Uh, but the relatively small size of many uh, small ASEAN economies uh, seems to imply that uh, if even greater regional uh, integration would be beneficial. So that's yeah, and I used AI to make all the pretty pictures of the uh, of the unicorns. That's all I have. I uh, thank you and uh, open for questions or move to the next speaker. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, um, and I I do did love the AI generated uh, unicorns. Those are very cool and distinctive, which is neat. Um, so we are going to need to move on, uh, but I will stress again, if our attendees have questions, please put them in the Q&A and if we're able to, we'll be able to come back. Um, so our next speaker is David A. Griffith. His talk is New Technologies Enhancing the Advertising Experience. Dr. Griffith is the Hallie Vander Heider Chair in Business, Professor of Marketing and Associate Research Director of the Center for International Business Studies at Texas A&M. Dr. Griffith specializes in the areas of strategy, global marketing, innovation, and international business. His work primarily focuses on working with executives to solve business problems. And uh, Dr. Griffith, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, exactly what I do. This this project really deals with an issue that some executives were working on in dealing with AI. So one of the areas that I've been dealing with is the issue of advertising. I've been doing this for about the last 30 years. Um, I look at advertising as being a means of communication. Um, so I ascribe to the information economics argument that really started in the 50s and then developed in the 70s which is really saying that advertising serves as an informational conveyance feature within society. Um, obviously, advertising is a massive industry. We're looking for $1 trillion um, in 2024, and we see increasing interest in AI in advertising, um, expected to be $107 billion by 2028. Now, just to get a little bit of background on what I do, in terms of my focus on international has always dealt with the issue of how firms understand operating in different countries. And so the issue from an international marketing and international advertising perspective has always been where do we gain leverage and increase effectiveness by customizing? And so sort of understanding that standardization versus adaptation approach when you're going globally. Um, I've also had a, a real interest in the introduction of technology, and I kind of find it, it fascinating where we are now in terms of virtual experience, because uh, me and some of my colleagues were working with um, a catalog retailer back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and we actually worked on the concept of virtual direct experience. So I really like to see the blending of technology to see how we can actually 
increase innovativeness within the business marketplace for the conveyance of information. Fortunately, I've had the opportunity to interface with a lot of different companies, both on the advertising side, like Ogilvy or WPP, as well as on the advertising tech side with companies such as Innovid. Um, and blending that with the opportunity to interface with executives is kind of where we came here. So if we think about AI, which is going to really be what we're focusing on within this topic, uh, there was a recent study done as part of the annual CMO survey that uh, Chris Mormon does, it was just out of Duke, which is also sponsored by the AMA and Deloitte. And so they do this annual survey to say, like, what are the most important areas that are happening within the field of marketing? And as we can see, for marketers, integration of AI is critical. And when we think about the integration of AI, we're really talking about um, content presentation and content um, creation. So you're looking at generative AI issues. And so when companies are looking at investing in AI technology, they're really look, looking to say, how can we use this so we can create greater personalization and content creation so that we can get improved return on investment, right? And so I look at this going back to what I had said earlier about when we think about the globe, we've always kind of looked at markets um, on a country basis and we structured advertising oftentimes on a country basis. And we really wanted to see if there was the opportunity to start using AI to make it a lot more personal. So in the international business um, research, we see that there's great cultural diversity across countries but actually there's tremendous intracultural variation. So within a country, the variations are actually much greater than the means between countries. And we think that AI can help solve this issue. And so we, we worked on two smaller test projects. Um, the first is on what we would call content personalization or one of, one of those areas. And so we wanted to test language bias. And language bias really refers to the cognitive preference that we have to favor those who communicate just like we do, right? Similar vocabulary, similar sentence structure. And so the, the theoretical aspect of this is that you're going to respond more favorably if someone responds just like you. And if you think about the, the sales literature, we often talk, times talk about mirroring, right? that we wanna sort of mirror the behavioral patterns, the speech patterns of those that we're selling to. And so we, we tested two hypotheses. And the first is reflecting on user language structure in response to promotional messages um, will increase engagement time. And the second is that it would increase click-through rates. So what we did was, um, this is in partnership with an online clothing retailer that has global operations. Um, this what I'm going to report here is only on the US and the UK side. Um, and so what we really did was we, we used a customized AI um, chatbot and we customized language based upon the customer prompts. And so we could use the customer prompts within the borders of either American English or British English or standard language um, to sort of reflect back um, on the customer prompts to see if we could engage them better. We restricted um, the analysis to those customers who, who started with prompts that were product related. We ran 30,000 English speaking customers randomly through the three different treatments. So you either had a treatment with a, um, an English American English language bot um, generated AI customization, a British English generated um, AI generated chatbot custom language program or a standard language program based upon whether they were speaking American English or British English. And so what we found was that we were able to see the engagement time increase by about 19% when they were going through the custom treatment. Because of the learning abilities of the natural language machine, natural language processing machine learning um, approach we were using, we actually saw no difference in terms of the English, American English sample or the British English sample. We also saw that there was a 35% increase in click through rate on the back end. Um, so that natural language bias that we have for people who speak and construct sentences like us can really be enhanced when we're using um, generative AI. 
The second test we were doing dealt with content presentation. And so this company has a tremendous amount of information on the people who come through its website and those who've been returning customers. So when you log in as a returning customer, and what we wanted to do was test preference for AI generated um, personalization in terms of how products were being presented and what products were being presented. It's very similar if you think about it from the standard um, or the, the standpoint of Amazon and how Amazon presents information to an individual, but we were able to customize it in terms of color, style, sizes, what was actually being presented to the individual consumers. And once again, we would argue that um, product presentations that are reflected of past consumer use are actually going to increase both your engagement time. And then, you know, we don't have a, we don't want, we did not want to go to a purchase side because purchase issues are a little more complicated, but we did want to go to the point of, are you actually engaging for a longer time? And are then you moving products into the shopping cart? And so this was also done with um, 30,000 customers, which were randomly assigned to the treatment groups. We use as the AI generated product presentation versus the standard product presentation. Um, and we just, we, we ran people through this until we were actually filled at 10,000 per, per person. The, the website runs about 290,000 people every two hours through the site. Um, our, our findings on this is we did find that engagement time increased by about 10%. So people stayed on the website longer when the content presentation was customized through AI generation and pre-purchase was increased by 13.32%. Um, so we saw significant, and these are significant numbers when you start doing the, the calculations onto the, the overall consumer um, return estimates. But what we saw is we saw additional lift, which shows tremendous promise. And I will say that when we look at the growth and promise of AI, um, we're we're hearing a lot of a lot higher lifts from people like Google or IBM with things like um, Watson AI, et cetera. But within the controlled lab field setting, we're seeing slightly larger, but clearly there's tremendous promise when we're looking for campaign creation um, and thinking of targeting mechanisms. And so from the international business sort of approach, we believe that, generative AI is going to allow us to, to move beyond national differences and actually work within national differences to customize to individuals' preference structures so that we can increase sort of that communication flow. And by increasing that communication flow or that increase of advertising effectiveness, that we're gonna see um, much more positive outcomes, not only in terms of you know, sort of sales, if you will, but that the consumer has a better experience, is better able to get the information they need, which we believe leads to overall greater social welfare. Um, and so that's my lightning talk. Um, I thank you for taking the time um, to listen and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, uh, we are again, still open up for questions, but um, I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, in regards to um, data sets for using for these customized um, voices, um, obviously, um, even within countries, you have certain dialects or variations. Um, are you able to find these data sets or are they just kind of trying to come along as they go? Uh, there's two different ways we, we've been looking at this. One is, so you can use you can use a standard language dictionary per country, right? And you can then customize it by IP address to dialectic region. But one of the nice things is if we're actually able to capture returning customers prompts and therefore we can build a customized data dictionary and language structure along each customer. And so that the more the customer interacts with the retailer's website, the more effective um, the chatbot is at sort of reflecting and restructuring its its approach. So tremendous promise, but once again, you know, you, you do start getting into issues of um, privacy concerns and things like that, that, that the company is very concerned about. Actually, that's a question that just popped up here. Um, uh, someone asked, how are you ensuring the language data is ethically obtained? 
Um, well, it's it's completely protected under encryption technology and not being shared or transmitted. And the company did not want to use, I mean, this is why the company did not use a, a plan or a, um, a Canaan software pro program. They actually created it through natural language processing using um, Python to create their own chat bot so they had full control of the database. Um, and that is one of the really scary things when we think about it. I mean, companies are very concerned about privacy. And if you're using backend software, someone else's someone else's processing, you're losing control of that. And so they were very concerned about, about their customers' data and obviously any press that would come about from sharing their customers' data. So they did it in-house. Excellent question though. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So uh, this will actually conclude the uh, formal portion of our program. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you as to all my colleagues, to the audience for joining us, to our speakers for sharing their expertise, and to the U.S. Department of Education. We are especially grateful because without Title VI funding for National Resource Centers and Centers for International Business Education and Research, we would be unable to present this program to you. So again, thank you all very much and have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening.